Matthew chapter 22, when you found it, will you give this young man? Oh, he has one, he has one, he has one. Matthew chapter 22, he's just not standing. This is the last Sunday I'm going to ask him to stand. Amen, hallelujah. Now the whole world knows it's the last Sunday. Now, Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. In the New Testament, the book is St. Matthew. The chapter is 22. The verses are 34 through 40. You know, when we go to court, we stand for the judge to walk in, and we are a servant to stand for God. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, when you found it, you discover these words. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is, like it, you should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and, and the prophets. I want to talk about our second core value. And our second core value is share responsibility. Share responsibility. Amen. For the last three weeks, we've been talking about the four, the, the five, the phase five of our church, the phase five, the five core values of our church. And I've said to you before that regardless of what we do, whether we are cooking pancakes or whatever we are doing, we need to make sure that we hold on to these five core values. The last two weeks I've, been, weeks, I've been saying to you, the first core value is to protect the unity. Protect the unity. Meaning that we ought to love one another. We ought to love one another until the world sees 
that we love each other. Jesus says that we ought to know uh, that you are his disciples because of our love for one another. If we're going to protect the unity, we must have love for each other. We must show our love and we must walk in that love. And on last week, I continued in uh, this core value number one by saying to you, as we go to protect the unity, we must refuse to gossip and we must follow leadership. Yes, we must refuse to talk about others. We must use to talk even that which is correct, even that which is right, if the intent is not God felt. If the intent is not of God, then it is gossip. So I said to you, we must protect the unity of the church. We must walk in unity. We must love each other and we must refuse to gossip. And the third thing under protecting the unity, we must follow the leadership that God has placed in the local church. So today we're looking at shared responsibilities. And we as a church ought to be willing, able, and ready to share our responsibility. Oftentimes when a new person comes into the church, we, we oftentimes, and this is before COVID, we oftentimes stay in our little clique. We oftentimes do our own little thing. We sit in our assigned, self-assigned seat. We have to get to a point where we share the responsibility first of being a welcoming church. A church that is welcoming the unchurched, the unreached, and the unsaved. We must welcome people who don't look like us. Welcome people who don't think like us. Welcome people who don't live like us. And welcome people who do not support what we support. We must be a welcoming church. Today I say to you that we must share the responsibilities. We must share the responsibilities in, some, in such a way that when a new person walks in the room, they understand that it's okay to be a part of the choir. They must understand that it's all right, regardless of what background you and what baggage you are handling, it's all right to be a part of the first impressions ministry. They must, they must come to the conclusion and they must understand real well by your actions that it's all right to be a part of the media ministry. It's because of the way we carry ourselves, it's because of that way that others feel comfortable. We have to even welcome those who, who don't even talk like us. There are some who talk proper and pepper. We ought to welcome them. All right. There are some that flat talk ebonics. We ought to welcome them. All right. And there are some that is flat out 100, 100 ghetto. Mm -hmm. I mean, down the earth ghetto, we ought to welcome yeah. them. We ought to share the responsibilities in such a way that when someone is of a, a faith that they don't believe like we believe, we ought to understand that they are welcome also. All right. No, we're not a, a seeker-sensitive church, but we are a welcoming church. Okay. You see, a seeker-sensitive church is a church that rearranges its programs, rearranges its celebration, so those who are not in Christ will fit in. But people who are not in Christ are looking for a church that is honoring God the way God has told us to. Yes, God, God is looking forward. God is looking forward to us being a church that is so welcoming that everybody understands that it is a welcoming church. Not only should we be a welcoming church, we ought to share our church. We ought to share our church. We ought to share our church building. We ought to share our church. And not all the time we're going to get topped off for sharing our church. But when you're doing ministry, ministry makes sense because God wants us to share. Yeah. Too often in, in local church congregations, people act like spoiled brats when they're playing on the playground. Yeah. 
I'm going to take my ball and I'm going to go home simply because I'm not having my way. I'm just so sick and tired. Can I just say that? Can I just tell you the truth? I'm so sick and tired of folk mumbling and grumbling about stuff that really doesn't matter. The next time I hear a person mumbling and grumbling, my question will be, what does that have to do with salvation, sanctification, and glorification? The thing about it is, those who complain are those who are not concerned about salvation, not concerned about sanctification, and not concerned about glorification. But when you get concerned, when you get concerned about salvation, when you get concerned about sanctification, when you get concerned about glorification, you, it will not matter if you have your way in. You will make sacrifices for God. You will make sacrifices for others. And if you choose not to make sacrifices, you just like the small brat at the age of two that's running around that don't want to share with anybody. God has called our church to welcome others, to go and look for others. When you look at Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is in a gotcha moment. Jesus is in a moment throughout this chapter, the Sadducees and the Pharisees are trying to catch him up. You know, everybody that asks you a question, Brother Miles, is not really asking the question just to get the right answer. In the text, they are asking Jesus questions so they can catch him up. Jesus is talking, and, and, and the first pericope, verses 1 through 14, Jesus is talking, and he's saying that the kingdom of heaven is like a king that went out and invited men to come to a marriage feast. He sent his servants out, and when he sent his servants out to invite men to come, men had everything else to do than to come to this wedding, even though Jesus said the king has made it ready. He went, he sent them out, and when he sent them out, nobody returned with the servants. He sent them out and, and invited them and arranged for, for this marriage and arranged for his servants to call those and invite those to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Have Jesus invited you somewhere? Has the king invited you somewhere and you're not willing to come? I believe, I believe today, I believe right here today, I believe even in the 21st century, even in the month of July, even a year and a half away from the start of a pandemic, people are still using COVID as an excuse. I believe they still using that as an excuse. You know, every person has to do what they are safe with, and every person has to do what they, they are convinced of. But I say to you today, whatever you do, do not refuse to show up where God invites you. I let you decide. I let you decide whether God is inviting you to, to a birthday party, whether God is inviting you to, a, to a, 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 a gathering at the gym, whether God is inviting you to an HOA meeting, or whether God is inviting you to the church. I leave it to you. But I'm saying, don't use COVID-19 as an excuse to do what you want to do and as an excuse to not do what you don't want. I've already concluded, before COVID came on, God and the devil were the two most lied on beings in the world. If they wouldn't say God told me to do it, they would say the devil made me do it. <laughs> now, now, if they didn't come to the conclusion that, that God told me to do it, and there's so many self-made prophets around here. I mean, they're so self-made. They have come to the conclusion over and over and over again that God's been speaking to them. Yeah, yeah. And they want you to believe that God has said some of this foolishness they're talking about. If you did your daily reading in the Sunday school lesson in Romans chapter 1, it deals with the fact that men have turned away to stuff that made sense to God and they created their own way. And not only have they created their own way, they've come to the conclusion that God is wrong and they are right. right. 
And then and now they've gotten so caught up until they, they, they trust more in the preacher than they trust the creator. In the text, it deals with this. In this first pericope, you find these servants going out and inviting them to come to the, the dinner, inviting them to come to some place been prepared, because verse number four says, the oxen and the fatted calves have already been killed. Boy, he had thrown a shindig for them. Sometimes people have come to the conclusion that it's not good enough for me. And because they come to the conclusion that it's not good enough for me, they just go their own way. It said that they still didn't come. But they made light up and they went their way. Some went back to their own forms and others went back to their business. They made fun of the king. Every day God is inviting us. The king has invited us. If you're saved, he's inviting you to come a little closer. If you're not saved, he's inviting you to get to know him. God is constantly inviting us, and we are still using excuses today as they did in biblical days. Then the rest of them who didn't go back to the farm, the, the rest of them who didn't, didn't go back to business, the rest of them that didn't make light of them, look at verse number six. The rest of them seized the servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. It's just like it's just like just like everyday life. People will kill you if you welcome them to Jesus. People, people will make light of you and be spitefully using you if you invite them to Jesus. And people will always mistreat you when you are a servant of the Lord. So don't get surprised when you get mistreated. You're not that special. You, you, you know, God has blessed you and, and God has happened to favor you, but you're not that special. You're not that special. You, God has made you who you are. But when the king heard it, the king was furious. And he sent an army out and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. When the king gets sick and tired, of being sick and tired, it's going to be far greater than Fannie Lou Hamer's sick and tired. Yeah, Fannie Lou Hamer said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, but the fact of the matter is, when God gets sick and tired, when God gets sick and tired of disobedience, when God gets sick and tired, he's going to really be sick and tired. God says the army came. He sent the army and killed the murderers, and when he killed the murderers, he burned their city. And then the servants, then he said to his servants, he says, make the wedding feast ready. And what you do is go to the hedges. Some back home they say go to the hedges and the highways. He says go to the highways, and when you go to the highways, invite other folk because these jokers one would. They weren't worthy anyway, so go invite somebody else. And then the Bible says that the dining hall was full. Let me tell you, you can miss your blessing being foolish if you want. You can miss your blessing being disobedient if you want. God never runs out of blessings, and he doesn't mind blessing somebody that will accept his blessing. Too many times, too many times, people think that, that God's going to bless them any old how. And because God is God, he's going to give me another chance. I just want to try it one more time. Let me tell you, somebody tried it one more time, and that was their last time to breathe. That was their last time for blood to flow the extremities of their body. He moves from, from this scene of the wedding feast, and he moves to the conflict with the Pharisees. And he deals with the fact that they always try to catch Jesus up. And verse 15 says, the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. They wanted to put him to the test. But Jesus recognized how they wanted to put him to the test. So they asked the question in verse 16, they asked the question, teacher, we know, first of all, folk will always tell you what they know about you. <laughs> Look what he says. He said, he says, Jesus. He said, he said, Master, he says, teacher, uh -huh. 
He says, we know you are true and you teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone. For you do not regard a person a man. Now tell us. Now after they've told Jesus who he is. After they've told Jesus what Jesus wants. After they've told Jesus how Jesus is not one who respect people and respect persons, respect men. Then they said, now tell us therefore. What do you think? Is it lawful to give taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus saw them coming. Jesus recognized what they were doing. So Jesus says, let me see that coin you have there. Mm -hmm. Whose picture is on this coin and whose writing is on this coin? Mm -hmm. Their reply was, well, it is Caesar's. Well, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar. All right. And render unto God that which is God. Now, we have folk all, all over the world uh, rendering unto Caesar that which is Caesar because they don't want to go to jail. Right. But when it comes to rendering unto God, since God ain't put them to jail, and he, they don't think he'll be put them in hell, and now they don't want to render unto God what is God. So he says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, and render unto God that which is God. Don't get the two twisted where you give more to Caesar than you give to God. That's right. That you don't re respect the government more than you respect God. <laughs> don't you know that God sees everything, God knows everything, and God even knows what you're thinking? Mm -hmm. So render unto Caesar, that's what you see, that's render unto God, that's what you God. And the next one, Rick, be, which begins in verse number 23, Matthew 22, verse 23, we deals with the Sadducees. Now, first of all, the Sadducees don't even believe in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. They don't have a clue about the resurrection. And then they're going to ask Jesus a question about the resurrection. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. They, they don't have a clue about the resurrection. But their question is, Jesus, since Moses said, if a man dies and he doesn't have a baby or a child, he doesn't have a son, he doesn't have a, a offspring, by a woman, but Moses says his brother ought to marry. After he dies, his brother ought to marry his widow. And then he says, and then that brother dies, and then the third brother dies, and then it's all the way down to the seventh brother dies. Now, Jesus, you tell us whose wife will they will he will she be when they get to heaven? Well, don't you know that there's no giving in marriage and giving and taking of marriage in heaven? Let me tell you something. The reason why we have to focus down here and make sure that every tub sits on its own bottom is because when we get over there, what we know here as a relationship is over. It doesn't matter how much I love Sister Davis, when she get out of here, or I get out of here, and she said that I got to stay around here at least to be a hundred. And so when she gets out of here, or I get out of here, it doesn't matter who we were married to. That's right. That's right. Jesus says, you don't know the word of God. You don't know the scripture. You could you confuse, and that's why men men say, "Well, I got to have a million dollar policy to leave my wife comfortably, so so she won't look at anybody else." <laughs> Let me just serve you notice today, brother. You can have a million billion dollar policy, and you ought to leave your family well off. And that's what you ought to do. Now, let me tell you something, Brother Dixon. You can get a million dollar policy if you want to, and leave it here. That's good. Praise the Lord. He's a good man. He's left something for his children, children. But let me tell you, just because you leave a policy doesn't mean that she ain't going to look at Joe Blow anyway. <laughs> Because what you leave is for her use and her use only. That's right. And she can spend it with whoever she wants to spend it with. She can go wherever she wants to go. The places you tell her she can't go now, she's going to go with your money later. All right, All right. The clothes you think that you controlling her and stopping her from buying, you just leave enough for her to buy a house for her. Because when you dead, my brother, these relationships that we have down here are over. That's right. That's right. So that's why God wants us to be the best husbands we can be. That's right. The best wives you can be. Be the best children you can be. Because over there, the relationships have changed. 
So don't even worry about it. Don't, don't get caught up. Oh, man, I, I, I got to make sure that she doesn't look at anybody else. I, I got to spend all my money so she won't spend it with anybody else. Let me tell you something. When you dead, she going to do what she want to do with it. That's right. That's right. Amen, women? Amen. Anything we want to do. Some of them say, I'm doing what I want to do with it right now. I hear you, I hear you. I've never been a woman, but I've been around a bunch of them. So he ain't got to lay down and die. I can, I can do what I want to do now. Oh, I, I told you a story. If you heard the story before, act like you never heard it before. Uh, at the funeral, this woman had a mean husband. He was mean. He never gave her anything, never did anything for her. And the last statement that he made before he died, he said, now look, Sister Davis, Sister Nicole Davis, he said, look, when I die, I tell you what, you take all my money and put it in my casket. <laughs> and at the funeral, at the funeral, at the funeral, she honored his request. She wrote a check for $3.5 million. Said, wait a minute, Undertaker. She put the check in the vault and said, close it now. Went back to her seat. Her girlfriend said, girl, you put all that money in that car coffin with him? She said, yeah, if he can cash it, he can have it. <laughs> Let me tell you something, you just don't get caught up on what's going on down here because there's another uh, another world on the other side where we're going to go from glory to glory. And down here is not to be compared to what we're going to see on the other side and what we're going to experience on the other side. Then we come to this pericope that deals with the, the, great, the greatest two commandments. Then one of them, who's a lawyer, they chose the one who's a lawyer because, you know, he, he was not only a lawyer of law, of legal issues, but he was also a lawyer of the book, of the Torah. He, he comes to him and he asks Jesus a question, teacher, which is the greatest law? Jesus said to him, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He says to him, this is the first and the greatest commandment. And Jesus knew he was going to ask another question, so he went ahead and answered that. He says, the second one is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. What he's saying is, these two commandments, are the hinges by which all the law and the prophets hang. What he's saying is, your lifestyle ought to be built around this. He says, you ought to love the Lord. And you ought to love the Lord with all of your innermost being. Love the Lord with everything within you, with your heart. Love the Lord deep down and in because if you love the Lord with all your mind, all your heart, and with all your soul, you're going to show up, show up for the Lord. God didn't have to beg you to do anything. People don't have to assign you to do anything. And when it comes to obedience, God doesn't have to look for you to do anything wrong because you love the Lord. You see, too many times we have cop outs. Those are those who will have excuses for anything. We have cop out. They, they cop out. Oh, I can't do this. Or I can't do this. I'm not that kind of person. It's just a cop out. Then we have dropouts. Those dropouts will, will fall out with you, and they are dropped out. They dropped out of school. They, they dropped out of social club. They drop, and guess what? They dropped out of church. They just quit. Everywhere they go, they quit. And if they marry to you, let guess what? It's just a matter of time. <laughs> if God doesn't change them, it's just a matter of time before they quit on you. And then, then we have those who are sellouts. The sellouts will do anything for a doctor. The sellouts will, will, will be bribed off any and everything. The sellouts, the sellouts will, 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 you can give them just a little bit of money and they will turn their back on God and certainly they'll sell you out. But let me just share with you today, God is looking for an all out. He's looking for somebody who's all out working for him, all out working with him, and all out working with his people. God wants you to be all out. 
Stop walking around making excuses for everything. Every time you complain, you just a cop out, you just a drop out, you, you, you're not an all out yet. Just walking around there every day. Some families, some families just fall out with each other. I mean, they just fall, they don't speak anymore. They don't visit anymore. I, I just, I just can't handle this. I'm done. There's somebody who had a wedding and the girl that was the bridesmaid couldn't find the right shoes and they fell out at the wedding and now 30 years later, they haven't spoken yet. The folk in the audience have forgotten the shoes. Most of them wasn't caring about the shoes anyway. And don't mention if one of the brides may stood in the doorway too long. And the, and the bride figured you were upstaging me. I mean, fell flat out. But when you are a all out for the Lord, it doesn't matter what goes on behind the scenes. It doesn't matter what happens. And some folk in church just drop out and drop in. They do just like the club over down in downtown. They, they drop in and drop out. The dude drop in, you heard about that? Oh, you heard him scream and read the rooster. The, the dude, they, they drop in, they drop in, in church like it's a club. It's like, it's like oh, I'm gonna, this is my day to show up. Well, since this is my day to show up, I'm gonna show up and still mean. Had changed since I've been known. They still walking around with their nose up in the air. And then, guess what? When they, they drop back in, they want everything to be just like they want. And they complain about the singing. They complain about the usher. They complain about the parking lot team. They complain about the, the media ministry. And God knows they complain about the preacher. I mean, that should be number one. I mean, the preacher's going to take a hit every time. But when you turn your heart toward God, when your mind is focused on godly stuff, when your soul is rooted in God, men, women, boys, and girls can tell when you are all out. I submit to you today, be an all out. Don't be a cop out. Don't be a drop out. Don't be a sell out. Be an all out. When people look to you and they wonder if you're going to be at the church, they wonder if you're going to be online, they can set their clock to it because you're going to be there. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be on time. Yes. I called a woman the other day and said, where, where you been? I said, our last conversation was that you were going to miss one Sunday, you know, and then you're going to be back. And said to me, well, you know, I had this. I said, cop out. <laughs> then I had this. Cop out. And after three cop outs, it needed the one cop out. <laughs> because God is looking forward to our hearts if our souls have been changed. If we've been redeemed like we say we are. If we've been changed and washed in his blood. Mess should not follow us. We ought to share the responsibility of welcoming people to the Lord, welcoming people to the church, welcoming people to the broadcast, and you welcome them by making sure that you are upbeat about your church. Yes, yes. God, relieve me of folk that expect people to join your church, visit your church, and you always running your church down. We gotta be willing to share the responsibility of others of us. We ought to, first of all, in the shared responsibility, we ought to pray for our church. We ought to pray for it. We ought to pray for our church. We, we ought to have prayer for our church. Every day of your life, you ought to be praying, Lord, bless the new beginning church. Lord, bless that church to have power. Bless that church to be a church that, that has growth. Bless this church, Lord, that this church will be a welcoming church to the unchurched, the unreached, and unsaved. Lord, bless this church. My heart is turned toward soul winning. If your heart is turned toward soul winning, your conversation is built around soul winning. Yes. If your heart is turned toward soul winning, your walk is built around winning souls. By now, some of you know that I've just started an amateur bike club. If you want to join, just see me at the service or inbox me. I started an amateur bike, 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 bicycle club. 
And I, I can see Sister Brown now, and I'm up to 10 miles an hour just rolling down the road. I mean, I can see her now. I can see her. Can't y'all see Sister Brown? I mean, I'm trying to catch up with her. She's up to 10 miles an hour. I'm hanging around 7 miles an hour trying to catch up with her. But even from the perspective of a bicycle club, we have an evangelistic thrust. We want to pray for people. We, we want to, to, to share the gospel with people. We, we want to talk to them about, have you heard of the four spiritual laws? And now I think Sister Henry is going to get her a three book. And she's going to be, she going to be stretching out. I mean, stretching out. They're going to be neck and neck. The two of them are going to be neck and neck. And in the midst of the shared responsibility, we understand that the preacher can't do it all. We understand that the preacher needs your support. We understand that God expects us to be turning so much toward him until God can bless us regardless of where we go. That's why we're going to be a global club where we go from one neighborhood to the other and share the gospel and pray for people and ask God to bless the church growth. And it's going to be amazing what God is going to do because our hearts are turned toward him. Our minds are focused on him. And our souls have certainly been changed by him. Some people won't even share the video. Sister Davis gets up every Sunday, every Wednesday, say, please share this video. Some people say, I ain't gonna do it. Why, why are you not gonna do it? I'm just trifling like that. <laughs> I just like that. That's just who I am. You just gotta take me the way I am. Let me just share with you. God is looking for growth out of you. God is looking for church growth from you. If you want to witness, share the video. And they made it so simple, you don't even have to start a watch party anymore. That was confusing for some of them. You just push share. And then you push share now, and bam, it's all over the world. Share the video. Then you ought to share the message that your preacher preached that day. You'll be preaching sound doctrine. And then you ought to welcome them to your website. Everybody know the website? www.nbcsouls.org. And they can watch every video that has been played for the last three years. That's www.nbcsouls.org. You have to share this responsibility. When we share it, we welcome people to see what we see, to experience what we experience, and to do what we do. That's how Jesus is. Jesus always says that our hearts ought to be turned. He says that our minds ought to be turned. And our souls ought to be turned toward God. And finally, he says to us today, you ought to treat your neighbors in love. He says, love your neighbor the way you love yourself. You ought to, I'm, I'm kind of afraid these days, so many suicides, I'm kind of afraid to say love your neighbor like, like you love yourself. Some folks don't love themselves. If you're on the verge of suicide today, let me just say to you, God loves you. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Don't do it. Hang in there. Trust God. Yes. I pray that I'm talking to somebody today that's on the edge. I'm saying to you today, don't jump off. Yes. I'm saying to you today, don't pull the trigger. Yes. I'm saying to you today, God loves you. He offers a wonderful plan for your life. Hang in there. The best is yet to come. Yes. The best is yet to come. Give God a chance to make a difference. You tried her, it didn't work. You tried him, it didn't work. You tried them, it didn't work. You tried it, it didn't work. Try God, he works all the time. He made you. Trust him to make a difference. Try God, he will make a way out of no way. He says, love your neighbors as you love yourself. You ought to love yourself. Many times people make other folk miserable because they don't love themselves. I mean, they make other folk life so miserable. If you see a person always complaining, always bitter, they got stuff going on on the inside, and they force it off on you on the outside. Because when you satisfied with yourself, 
you all right with you, you can be all right with somebody else. That's right. That's right. Let me tell you, I'm, I'm all right with me. I want to serve notice today that, that I'm all right with me. I'm all right. I don't need a drink to know I'm all right. I don't need a snuff to know I'm all right. I don't need a, a, a puff to know I'm all right. I don't even need a cigarette to know I'm all right. I don't need a crowd to know I'm all right. I don't need a game to know I'm all right. I know I'm all right because God has made me all right. Yes, yes, say it. You need to be all right with yourself. Yes. You ought to love yourself. Yes. Matter of fact, you ought to love yourself better than your mama loved yourself. Yes. You ought to do yourself no harm. Let me just share with you. Do yourself no harm. Don't, don't act like you you going you to snitch something. Don't, don't act like you're going to run off the wall. Don't, don't act like you're going to tear up something. Love yourself enough to love somebody else. Let me tell you, you mess around and start dating somebody asking who doesn't love themselves, you're in a ball of trouble. I can see it now, but Pastor Davis, he walked pretty. He had a nice voice, Pastor Davis. <laughs> he had both legs, Pastor Davis. I mean, I just love his legs. I'm going to say, ask him, does he love the Lord? What church he goes to? Does he sleep in church? Is he excited about the Lord? If he cannot fill out any of these as yes, Leave him alone, give him 50 feet to the left, to the left. Get out of his way because he didn't love himself. Any man that loves himself loves the Lord because God is love and love comes from God. Yes. Yes, we must share this responsibility. We must share the responsibility of loving other people to Christ. We can't force them to Christ. We have to love them to Christ. We have to show them that we love love Christ and they see God's love rolling through us and they, they see every day that you wake up you don't have to have a smile on your face but they know that there's something on the inside that's working on the outside and you know you, when you go through tough times they know that there's something on the inside working on the outside they will find out that the greater one is in you did it in all the world. Who is the greater one? His name is Jesus. He's the one that took a tree and, and died for you and me. He's the one that went up Calvary's hill. He's the one that gave his life for you. And let me tell you, Jesus died for you. Had it not been anybody else on planet Earth but you, Jesus would have died for you. He loves you that much. He died for you. They laid him in a bar tomb. He rose early that third day morning with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. Yes. Jesus shares with us the responsibility of loving people to the kingdom. I say to you today, trust Jesus. Hang on to core value number two. Share the responsibility of welcoming people to this household of faith. Welcoming people to Jesus Christ. The door of the church is open. Amen. The invitation is made. You ought to come to Jesus. Just as you are. The door is open. Trust Jesus. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. The door is open. Will you try him? Will you trust him? Will you come and trust Jesus? If you've never trusted him as your Savior, will you bow your head with me and invite Jesus into your life, believing in the story that over 2,000 years ago he died for your sins? He was buried in a barber tomb. He rose from the dead. Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. 
and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you pray this prayer, you are now born again. When you die, you go to heaven. We believe that Jesus Christ has saved your soul. Now we believe that you are join a good Bible teaching church, and I recommend the New Beginning Church, where Jesus is first place. If you want to join our church or you receive Christ today, please inbox me or catch me out the service and let me know that you, you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church or you receive Christ today. We'll be glad to welcome you to the family of faith. Also, if you struggle with sin like I do, inbox me and let me know what I need to be praying for you with and for, and I will be praying for you and me, and we will pray together. Just inbox me and let me know. So we can share these responsibilities together. Open the eyes of your heart. Open my heart. I want to see you. Yes, Lord. I want to see you. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand up real high and you will be served. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served.
also watching on our live broadcast, you can contribute to the New Beginning Church two ways. First of all, you can go to Zale. You can go to Zale and you can uh, sell your money, your tithes, and your offering to lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Y'all bring it down some. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our, our Zelle account. Or you can mail to New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for these offerings. We thank you for those that are giving online. We pray that you bless us, Father God. Bless every giver and bless every gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. In all, in all. Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. 10.30 a.m. every Sunday. Thank you so much, and God bless you, and God keeps you. Peace out.